Hello, today is September 5th, 2013. We're meeting today with Mr. Alvin Plucker at his home in LaSalle, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Alvin, and uh, thanks for sitting down today to, to, to tell your story. It's no problem. I think this story needs to be told. Very good. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I was born uh, April the 23rd, 1946, in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, it's pretty strange why I was born in, in New, Mexi uh, New Mexico, because my dad had, had gotten out of the... Uh, Army Air Force at the time, and he was working under a contract for the railroad company, and uh, and we were there. I was there for about two years of my life, and from there on in, I, I'd moved to Nebraska, you know, and and I was raised in Nebraska. Um, uh, my dad started out on the on the um, on working for the state fish hatchery division there in in Nebraska, and and I was raised for 18 years on a state fish hatchery. Uh, of course, I learned all about fishing and that was would later become the, the prime, one of my prime interests as well as all the other things that I used to do. Uh, my dad was, like I said, he was a, a sergeant major in the, in the 401st bomb squad and uh, he had flown missions out of England uh, he met my my mother in uh, in Denver, Colorado, and they'd got married during the war. I have uh, one other brother, Jerry, and two sisters, Penny and Shirley. And, and where do you fit in that order? I am I am the second oldest boy. Um, there was only four of us in the family, and we were a pretty close knit family. Although Dad was Dad was certainly ruled us with a good old iron hand, like he was typical Pennsylvania Dutch German from from Pennsylvania. So anyway, uh, I grew up on this fish hatchery, and and there I learned the habits of not only raising fish, but hunting was one of my prime things, and also being very ornery. I was an ornery person. I was a, what they call a maverick. <laughs> and uh, I had problems with uh, obedience quite a bit. I, I tend to wander off and do whatever I wanted to do and felt like I could get by with it. Although uh, I probably had a, an iron butt, but, <laughs> but you know, spankings come normal. But uh, anyway, it, uh, it was kind of a matter of I killed my first rattlesnake uh, at age five, or actually I brought home the first rattlesnake at age five. I had tied a small rattlesnake on a on a string and was toting it around. It was only about like a foot long. And I towed it into the house and, and I can distinctly remember my mother getting all upset at me and says, you shouldn't have brought that thing in here. You don't bring them kind of things. You could have got bit. And she runs out and she gets a hoe and comes in and chops it up. Kills it right in the house because it was a baby rattlesnake. Well, that started my, that started my career, which is currently even go ongoing, of destroying every rattlesnake I, I come in touch with, <laughs> and I've killed hundreds of rattlesnakes. At the age of at the age of nine, eight, I guess it was at the age of eight, I was I was uh, killing rattlesnakes on a regular basis. I would go out and. Uh, and take a stick and, and go to the prairie dog towns or or I would go to uh, rock cliffs where their, where their dens were and I would drag them out and, and kill them. And it, it just so happens that many times when they were faster than I was and they'd make the lunge for the hole to get in, I'd grab them by their tail and just pull them <sighs> out and throw them out and kill them. Ever, and, ever bitten in your career? I've been struck three times in, in in my boots, but I never got bit because, contrary to belief, they can't bite as high or as long distance as pe people think. You know, they can only really strike half the distance of their length. And they don't strike very high normally. Normally a good nine-inch shoe or something, you know, they're not going to be able to clear it. But anyway, um, 
I, I went on killing them with sticks like that, and, and my grandfather was getting pretty worried. He says, I, this guy is, he can't, I can't control this guy. We can't control him. <laughs> so he went and he bought me a 22 rifle, a single shot. Well, in those days, a single shot rifle cost about eight or nine dollars, you know. So anyway, he bought one, and that was great for me. I shoot one and and go to using it using it for a club or carry a club extra because in these dens there'd be more than one there'd be a lot of them and they're all moving around fast and you don't have time to reload well that didn't go over too long and, and uh, then when I reached nine my grandfather says well we've got to come up with it he says you want a pistol huh and I says yeah so we so we went to the sporting goods and got a I got a Harrington and Richardson nine shot, uh, 22 pistol. I got really good at it. I used to practice uh, as I walked along the uh, the fence lines. I would stick wooden matches on one fence post, get to the other fence post, turn around and shoot the shoot the match. And I got pretty good at that. So I still have that gun to this day, and I still use it. Um, but that. That kind of uh, that was ongoing for the rest of the time that I ever did it. But in the, in the meantime, and like I said, I grew up in south southwest Nebraska. There was all kinds of uh, all kinds of blowouts, and this was in the fifties. And these blowouts would blow real deep. The sand would blow out of them, and it it it, it literally blow craters, and hmm. and it would just be. Uh, clear down to the old bedrock sometimes and there would be Indian artifacts on them and, and I got to, in the habit of collecting in, Indian artifacts and and I collect to this day. I have literally hundreds of them. And uh, so anyway, that that started a different type of career and, and all these times that I was growing up, that's what I was really interested in doing. I didn't have much to to do with people. I had many times that that, um, that I would be like oh, really young, like seven or eight years old, and I'd be gone. I'd take off and go fishing or go hunting, and I might be gone all day, and, and my parents would have half the county out looking for me. <laughs> and in one instance, I've, I'd found this nice cave that was in these rock cliffs on the fish hatchery where I, where I grew up, and I had excavated this this cave I dug the dirt out of it and uh, found some Indian artifacts in it but I used to I used to do a lot of digging on it so one night I decided to stay all night and the next morning I got up and and walked a usual two or three miles home and my parents had had half the county out looking for me and and I really got I really got nailed in <laughs> um, but anyway it never really taught me all that much I uh, times went on when I was younger and, and I had a lot of real good friends in high school. Uh, I was the last uh, graduating class in our school. There was only six of us at the time. Uh -huh. And then they closed down the high school and then the next year they closed down the grade school. And uh, But anyway, when I graduated, I graduated in uh, April of 64 and I had been working off and on and during the summers uh, you know putting up hay and and mowing and stuff for local farmers and then I forked moss on the fish hatchery uh, originally started that when I was about like seven or eight years old I got a quarter a day for forking moss and then it was a quarter an hour and whatever they wanted to give me but I always worked and and so when I got out of the out of the uh, out of high school, why well, my dad and I had a big falling out and 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 I'd done something wrong. Obviously, I think it was a fight with my sister over a favorite chair in front of the TV or something. Remember, in the fifties now, you know we only had off and on TV on a Friday night and a Saturday night. And that's all you had. The rest of the time, you could watch a test pattern, and everybody fought <laughs> to get right in front of, to watch a, either a, a baseball game or Lawrence Welk or Gunsmoke, you uh -huh. know. Uh -huh. And that's usually about what was on. 
And uh, so I and my sister got in a fight, and my dad's favorite was 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 my sister, and and he come in and he hit me and knocked me down, and I and I got up and I said, well, that's the last time that will ever happen, and and I. I walked the seven miles to my grandparents' place. Now, my grandparents, they took care of us a lot when we was raised. My dad and mom fought a lot, had a lot of problems, you know, and we'd end up down there and for sometimes long periods of time. And, and uh, but anyway, it was, it was, it was sort of like that was my, my grandparents is really was like my parents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my grandfather and I were really close. We used to fish and hunt together and all this stuff. And and uh, he taught me a lot of things about trapping and and a lot of things that I would have never learned, you know. And and my grandfather and my grandmother's name is is Art Hanshaw and Gladys Hanshaw. And they were originally from Missouri and they had moved up in Nebraska. They were some of the pioneers. My uh, great grandfather, which belonged to, was a Hanshaw. He was uh, 103 when he passed away, and and uh, he was uh, a gun toter. Looked like he carried six six guns, uh, six shooters on his side. He was a sheriff at one time, and he was uh, but he was also a ventriloquist and worked for a carnival at one hmm. time. So it was kind of interesting there, but. Uh, I think the the blood type that was always in me to be on my grandfather's side to be pretty ornery, you know. Uh -huh. My grandmother's my grandmother's side of the family, uh, I didn't know much about, but they, uh, but they, uh, my my grandfather and my grandmother, they were passed from family to family. They never really seen their their kin that much when they were growing up. They just lived wherever with aunt and uncle and friends mm. and wherever, and that's pretty much what they did. My my grandfather's uh, mother, her maiden name was Kennedy, and she always claimed that she was related to the Kennedys, but nobody put much stock in it. But the interesting thing is I got a, a long history. I'm, I'm the, I am the fourth prisoner of war in, and my extended family. Wow. Now, two of the prisoner wars, they were in, in the Civil War, and they were captured, and one was held in Andersonville, and one was Ooh. Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. And they both, uh, they, uh, one had uh, two balls in his leg, and one had ball, one ball in his other leg. None of the balls were ever taken out because they, was, they always knew that there was always a chance of getting infection, so if they could survive, they left them. The, the, the one obviously had a, a bad limp, and I've got all their personal records in my safe and everything on them. Uh, what they earned and where they was at and what runs, what battles they was in when they got them and when they were captured. And and, uh, and then I had another extended cousin that was also a prisoner of war in World War Two. But anyway, they uh, I don't know a lot about him. Don't have the papers on him, but they. Um, anyway, I got to. I got to my grandparents' place, and they took me in for a while, and they says, "Well, your dad's going to be coming for you," you know. So I says, "Well, maybe I better leave then." So they called my. Uh, they called my uncle from Colorado Springs, and he come down and got me and took me up there, kind of like a safe haven, you know, and um, and I went to work for a little while there on a. Uh, as a tree surgeon for the city of Colorado Springs, and but uh, all the time I was doing this, naturally I was starting to get the, uh, my hormones were starting to rage, and I was seeing these women, which you know in a small school you didn't see a lot of that. <laughs> I mean there was women there, but they were friends. Yeah. So I started looking around. So I I met this. Ex Navy guy, or not ex Navy guy? It was a it was a, a Navy guy on on leave, and he originally was a fireman for the for Colorado Springs, and he went into the Navy and become a fireman, and and he was home. And he was a real nice guy, and we used to go to Prospect Lake and, and pick up on these girls, 
and uh, it was a fascinating thing. That's when I made the decision when the draft come due that I was not going to be in the Army or any other branch of the service. I wanted to be in the Navy. Hmm. So I decided I was going to be in the Navy. So I went down and joined the Navy and left before and never told my parents nothing. Huh. I was 18 years old, didn't need any permission right, or nothing. Right. So I, I went, when I went into the Navy, I went out to San Diego to be in, in the boot camp uh, at uh, San Diego at the Naval Training Center. And, and how was that transition for you? Here, I, here I, I, I see a, a, a very independent uh, guy as a civilian going into the military. How was uh, was that well, much of a transition for here, you? Here we was in Nebraska. I mean, we were backwooded. Yeah. We, we uh, w I didn't know there were such things that existed that outside of the world of, 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 of being in the wild. Yeah, yeah. First thing I did was even on the airplane, scared to death. First time ever on an airplane. Uh -huh. That was bad enough. It was bad enough seeing the recruiter and him telling you all these things. Oh, you're going to have a nice time. You're going to get to see the world. It's just nothing but great and all this stuff. They do anything to get you in there, of course. Yeah, yeah. And once I got on the airplane, I got to San Diego. I had no idea where I was going or not or nothing. I, I really can't remember all the details, but I yeah. know somehow or another I managed to make it to boot camp. When I got there, I never even realized that, that there were cities this big, you know. I mean, I didn't, I knew nothing about the world. I mean, you're, you're pretty scared. Yeah, I'll you're, bet. You know, you, you're, your stomach is pretty queasy. And, and uh, here you get to, to this, to the, and you see all these uh, military people going on, and you see these, I, I believe if I remember right, if, on the way, we went past some big ships, and I never realized ships could be that big. <laughs> I mean, and most of them were not carriers, and I never realized ships could be that big. So, anyway, we get our training. Well, of course, then all of a sudden, here's my memories of flashback of how brutal people can be. I mean, don't don't misunderstand me, but these people had a job to do, and they did it. Right. But the thing is, to us, it was downright brutality. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember that they ever laid a, a hand on me, but just yelling point blank in, in your ear and calling you everything under the sun and, and the constant workout and push-ups and running and all this stuff, that was that was like a whole different different world. Now, the fortunate thing was that I was quite an athlete. And I was, I had went to the state many times in track and I was a discus thrower. I placed second place in the state for discus throwing. Huh. And I, I, you know, and I, I knew what hard training was. I, I trained for the discus by throwing a shot put. And uh, so I, I knew all these kind of things and I knew what a rigorous training was. And, and I played basketball and I, I usually average anywhere from 12 to 22 points a game and so I was I was pretty good at most of these kind of things and and so I get in okay I can I can put up with the constant uh, marching and running and all this stuff but I couldn't couldn't I never learned to take the yelling and screaming at you like you know they're trying to ruin your identity um, uh, but you know it, it's a it's a matter of it's a matter of they can't take your identity away from you because it'll be restored again anyway. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I didn't do too bad most of the time in boot camp. Um, eventually, I ended up with uh, the measles, and I'd never I guess I never had the measles before, but I'm not sure. My mother said I did, but I don't know. But I got the measles. Well, of course, you know, you don't want to, they don't want you to, to leave to go to sick bay, and you don't want to go to sick bay, and you put up with it. And I put up with it so long that I ended up with pneumonia. Mm. 
when I when I got pneumonia, they they uh, they sent me to Balboa Hospital, and I was I was in Balboa Hospital for a month and seven days. Uh, the first seven days, I was in an oxygen tent, and it was every day and every night poking you, poking you with needles, and and even when you come out of the oxygen tent, and they, it was constant drilling to to lean over the side of the bed to try to cough your lungs up to get all the fluid out. Well, it left me with a damp one damaged lung mm. about the size of a silver dollar which shows up on all my rec uh, my x-rays nowadays it gets people all excited you know and uh, so anyway I, I survived that part but in the meantime they was doing all these tests on me and they said they found me TB positive well that's new you know TB positive hmm well okay so they they sent me back to the Naval Training Center and issued me a new company because I'd, I'd lost mm -hmm. behind. And I got into this new company. Well, um, uh, they told me that it was it was what they call chow week, when, when everybody had to help in, in the, the, to do the, the dishes and work with the food. Well, they told me I couldn't, I couldn't be there because I was TB positive. Well, that's good. I didn't want to work there anyway. That was hard work. In the meantime, I'd found out that a company that was before this company had RCPOs and APO1, two large colored guys that were ex-army. They were in com they were in command of the company. They weren't they weren't a company commander. They were enlisted. You know, um, they were just recruits. But they were in charge, and they were really mean to their outfit. And one day they found them, they found that both of them hung by clothes stops in the, in the shower room. And they drilled the whole base for a long time on this. And I never really heard it all, but uh, speculation was if they, if they court-martialed the whole company or what, I have no idea. But it went on for a long time. Oh, wow. huh. Yeah, that, when you're too mean to people, people, and you and you got forty people under you, you know, things happen sometimes. And so that was kind of an interesting scare back there. And and you know, people, I think people started realizing that you can only, that if you're going to have these people in charge of them, that you've got to watch what they do, you know. And so anyway, I went on and I eventually graduated and I, I, I can't remember, I can, I can visually remember the commanders on, on both the company commanders on both of my companies were nice guys. But I cannot, I cannot remember the names yeah. anymore. Yeah. Everything before the times uh, of being a prisoner of war has kind of dissipated. Sure, okay. So my, so I, I got this, I got discharged from boot camp, and they sent me home on, on liberty. Well, when I when I got home, I went straight to Colorado Springs, and I visited my uncle, and my dad come up. And my dad, he was full of tears and everything, and he was sorry he was uh, been so mean to me all those years and all this stuff, and and uh, he didn't want to see me. He hated to see me go into the military, and why didn't you tell me about it and all this? And I said, well, we, we never got along, yeah. you know. Um, so anyway, um, I, I, I visited with him for, I think I had like a week and don't remember a lot, but but uh, it was a different situation. And, and uh, so I went back, and uh, my new station would be on the USS Hornet and the first place I'd be going was to the Far East uh, you know Asia and uh, so I reported to Long Beach to the USS Hornet well when I first was delivered there by taxi to the base and I walked onto the base and I seen this huge ship I mean the Hornet isn't one of the biggest aircraft carriers but to me you know, four to six stories is plenty high enough for me, and it's huge. 
So I said, I reported to board, you know, and naturally when you report to board, if you're, if you're, when you go on deck, the first thing you do, you get to the top, you salute the flag. You salute the flag, you salute to the officer of their deck, and you better just salute everybody because somebody's going to demand it of you anyway. So anyway, I got on, on there and I, and I was supposed to report to my new duty station. Well, my new duty station would be that, that, that after, I, I originally tried to get to, uh, I wanted to be an Airedale. I wanted to be in the air group on a carrier and they decided that they wanted to put me as a quartermaster. They needed quartermasters more. Well, what was a quartermaster? Well, a quartermaster, of course, is in navigation department. I'd have to do a bunch of rigorous training, and 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 it's quite an elite. Actually, it's an elite department. Oh, sure, yeah. And uh, kind of like uh, I never used to say this too much, but it's kind of higher than just about anybody. Uh, department is just higher than anybody else on the ship. And so anyway, I reported to to navigation department and. And there was all these, usually pretty nice characters on there, you know. Uh, some of them are harder nosed than others, but there was about twenty some of them quartermasters. And this is where I do the on on the job training. I knew little about it. They would eventually send me to quartermaster school. They would send me to petty officer school. They would send me to navigation school, and they would send me to. Uh, uh, signalman school and also to a uh, weather school in, in in Japan so I had to learn quite a bit well I went on there and I was on there a great many years now to to, to bring up the, the type of people that you can have in a situation like this you got to remember some are drafted and some aren't you know and um, we had one ex-army guy that was that was uh, he was a, a an e an e5 no, an E4 in charge of us, and uh, an, uh, of a seaman, and he was uh, he was a very mean, mean person. I mean, he would punish you, and and just about everything you could do, it was always really bad. He was he was a bad person, and he had so many enemies that that one time that he come back and he was he well the first thing that happened is him and one of the other seamen. They met up in the bar and they had some words and this seaman took a bottle and he knocked his teeth out. Oh. Well, when they got back to the, the ship, of course, after he got out of the medical department, he come after him and he, be, and he beat up on him. So that, that notwithstanding, uh, the, the next, next time that he was out, um, they decided bunch of the guys decided that when he comes back into the compartment we're going to jump him. So they jumped him and took him down and tied him up. And and we had reported this to the, the chief uh, quartermaster quite a few times and nothing ever got done. And finally I guess the navigator which was a, a uh, lieutenant commander decided that it was time for him to be transferred and they transferred him off of there. But he swore he was going to kill each and every one of us. Well. To follow up on him, we, we learned later that he was a Texan, and he went back to Texas and ended up in prison for the rest of his life. So, mm, wow. So, it, you know, just to show you, that there's good people yeah. and there's bad people. Yeah. And and he had everybody pretty well scared, you know, to, to want to do things. And that wasn't the way they do it. Certainly don't do that nowadays. Anyway, I stayed on the ship for... Uh, uh, well, into, into 1967, I had three tours off the coast of Vietnam. When we first got, when we first headed for, uh, for, uh, Hawaii, we had a really nice time in Hawaii. Hawaii, as, as you know, is nothing but paradise and, and a lot of, a lot of snazzy looking girls all over the beach and. And, uh, it must have been really something for a country boy. Uh, yeah, uh, you, know, you know, a beach like that, and you just chase women all day long. Yeah. The thing is with the quartermaster is that once you got into port, unless you had a lot of cleanup to do, which you very seldom had, then you just went on liberty, you know. 
and um, so anyway, we 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 go. I'd go out with a few buddies. I can remember some of the guys pretty good, you know. Uh, you know, uh, Stuart and Church and some of these guys that I used to have parties with, and we used to drink, you know, literally kegs of beer, and, uh, and did a lot of carousing, you know. But but I wasn't too too sexually active, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I just like to have fun and. And uh, anyway, uh, we got out. Uh, we got on our way again, and we headed to Vietnam. Well, I never had heard ever of Vietnam. I mean, I never heard of Vietnam. I didn't know there was a Vietnam war going on in Vietnam. And we get to Vietnam, and we're going to patrol and fly aircraft off. Well, this was really exciting for me because I got to watch. Aircraft taking off and flying back on board, all shot up, some of them, and they would crash into the island, and some of them would skid across and fall off the other side, mm. and, and the pilots would sometimes be on fire, and it, it was pretty exciting to watch this stuff, but I'm glad I wasn't in it. Yeah, right. And, um, but they would do these, these, these raids, I guess you could call them, or, or flights over Vietnam and drop their bombs and come back. And uh, so anyway, uh, that was pretty exciting for me. And and uh, I, for many years, I, I went back. I just kept doing it for three three tours. And I rather enjoyed most of it, you know. And and uh, I enjoyed the liberties in different ports. The, we had we went to Australia three times. Hmm. And uh, that was real, real interesting. Uh, but Japan was probably one of the most interesting because there's where you got in, indoctrinated to the, the loosest women on earth. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know, because every other bar was a house of prostitution, I think. So you had a lot of, a lot of things going on there. And... Uh, um, and how, how was it? Let me. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but how was it? Here's this uh, this country boy from Landlock, Colorado, or uh, Nebraska, going to sea. How how was it initially for you? Did you able to get your sea legs, or how? No, was it? it it never it never bothered me to be on water. I think I think the reason was that, that I practiced a lot in a rowboat on a fish hatchery, you know, a lot, and it had big lakes, you know, and and uh, I it never I never ever got seasick, and I, and when I was on the other ship. You know, I could have got seasick a lot of times because that ship was only 160, right, right. 67 feet long, and this other one is, you know, I don't remember how long the horn, the hornet was, but it's huge. Yeah. I mean, you don't feel nothing. You're lucky to feel, you're lucky to feel uh, uh, any movement in the ship at all. Now, there's two times that that it was kind of scary. One time we went into a typhoon oh. and we got some, believe it or not, we got some end damage on the ship it actually buckled up the the end of the hornet just a little bit from damage by a typhoon and we had to do go back and do some repairs on the front end of it and 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 then there was another time when when we was off the coast of Vietnam that that all of a sudden we we were in the middle of the night we all woke up to to general quarters and went to general quarters station and then we could we could feel our ship, and we hear this big boom, and you could feel the ship move, vibrate, move. I, I said, we're under attack, you know. Well, apparently, once they, 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 uh, once the captain, uh, once he got a hold of, uh, of uh, his command, they had told him that the Russians, on their way back home, decided to, to uh, drop some of their payload, their bombs. To get rid of them before they landed, and they didn't know we was below them. Oh wow! Huh. So we almost come to th you know, some big problems right there. That just goes to show you they were just teasing us, you know. Yeah. And uh, then, then another time, uh, uh, and it wasn't my fault because luckily enough, when we got into 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 Sydney Bay in Australia, they have a pilot come on. The pilot always steers the ships in to, to port, not the captain. The 
pilot does. And the pilot went underneath the Sydney Bridge, and he got too close to one side and tore the mask off the Hornet. Hmm. Just knocked the mask off, and that was that was something. That was something also. Uh, but to, to explain a little bit how I worked up there, you know, this is there were so many funny things that that would go on in these ships in the Navy. I mean, there's, there's you know contradictions to everything. But I would work on the bridge level, and that's where I corrected charts and did navigation and everything else. And uh, and then uh, uh, I would work under Captain Pardee. And he was one of those uh, full dress type captains. When you were there, you had your you had your ball cap on, you had your whites on. He was always in uniform, total uniform. Now, the, when the flag come on, the admiral's plot, and the flag, uh, the admiral will be up there. Then sometimes we were sent up to work under him. As the years got by, uh, you got better. You went up there. And he was so different. We were, we were going across the equator, and it was so hot. You know, 100 degrees and 180 percent humidity. You know. Yeah. You just just drip, and and he so we show up on the bridge, get our assigned duty, and you know, go up to the admiral's plot. You know, we'd show up totally dressed uniform, get up there, and, and the admiral will come in and says, "What are you guys doing?" With, all that gear on. He didn't take your take your blouse off and take your hat off, and he says it's too hot. Huh. And we would do this, and then the captain would come up and say, "What are you guys doing out of uniform?" And chew us out for being out of uniform. Yeah. It was like this all the time. Yeah. Who's the boss? Yeah, you know? yeah, right, right. <laughs> so it, it it there's always funny things to this, and and you know, and 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 of course we did a lot of a, a lot of. Uh, tricks and jokes it's hard to remember but well on uh, each other but one one if you might, don't mind uh, bringing up you talked about crossing the equator do you want to go over the polywag uh, did you went through the polywag uh, uh, yeah we we become shellbacks shellbacks yeah and we had to become a a, a, a polywag you know they called us and what they did was was uh, was they would set up uh they would set up a s different stations for and, and uh, and old old timers, I mean, let's say, uh, uh, I don't know what they call them. I forgot. But anyway, they would they would set up, and you'd have to go through these like like this uh, garbage barrels, and and uh, and you'd have to kiss the belly of the fat man, and and King Neptune they yeah, called him, yeah. and uh, and and a lot of times they'd say that hey we got a we got a a flying fish here that's caught in this in this box and we want you to peek in and look at this flying fish and 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 you'd open up and take a peek in to see that flying fish and they'd smack you with a broom in the butt and there was all this time but that was initiation to becoming a shellback and i went around i went around the world twice yeah. so i'm a double shellback you know so i i and i've still got the paper on that that's that i'm glad you brought that up but but uh and you know we we did a lot of a lot of different things like that on on the ship and uh, the other another thing that we did is we pulled into uh, uh, I believe it was Australia or New Zealand one and they and we shut down and and we had to do from from the hangar deck not the flight deck that's quite a ways up there the flight deck is where the airplanes take off and the hangar decks where they're stored below decks. We had to all of us had to do man overboard drills, and they had they had a rescue boat below, and everybody was shown how to do the cannonball type of, of of jump and hold your nose and everything and jump in, and then as soon as you hit the water, they had they had the water all uh, oil poured all over the water and they had it on fire, and you jump into this fire. Mm. And then when you come up, you got to splash. You got to splash your hands all over to disperse the oil and and uh, and flames. And then you had to stay afloat for a certain time. And then you had to take off your uh, you took off your bell-bottom trousers, and you tied a knot in each leg, 
and you flipped them over your over your back to, to make air pockets in the legs and you use them for your floating device. And I, I figure it's probably at least two stories down from the hangar deck that we had to jump. Hmm. But they had they had rescue parties down there, one at a time. Wow. Each department. Uh. Yeah. So uh, but that was that was something exciting and I was a good swimmer. I used to swim a lot on the fish hatchery. I'd swim across the lakes, but I wasn't I wasn't an outstanding one, you know, like like some of these continental type, you know, but but I, I could stay up and I, I used to swim from uh, uh, from Seal Beach to Long Beach down the coast. I just swim that all the way down the coast at seven miles. <laughs> and I just just for the heck of it, you know. But but salt water, as you know, is more buoyant. Your your body weighs less or something. Yeah, held up easier. And um, but anyway, it it you know that was uh, a long career there, and I thought my career was over. I I enlisted for four years, and I got down to um, uh, I was due to be discharged in July of the following year, and I got down to. Uh, I believe it was November of 67 and I was supposed to be discharged in 68 and uh, they said we can't send you back for a third tour in Vietnam so I said okay uh, you know what's my options and they says well Captain uh, Party says I really don't want to lose you you're one of my top people I was uh, I was uh, E4 at the time he says, I want to keep you here. You want to try to stay? And I said, well, I'd like to. I says, I don't care if they have to fly me from Japan home or what, you know. So anyway, it uh, he got a hold of Bupers. And he says, well, we have these we have these orders for you. And he, he called me in one day and he says, these are the, your new orders. He says, they want you to go to this, to the... Bremerton, Washington, to get this ship ready for action, you know. And I had no idea what this ship was. They said, do you want to go? And I said, no. And he, so he gets on the phone and he calls Bupers. He says, I'd like to get this man transferred. And this guy, I'd rather keep him here. And and they, they told him, no, these were hand-picked people. Mm. That they were all going to go. Oh wow! And so he says, "You got to go." So he turned to me and he says, "I guess you got to go." He says, "That's my orders." So I I I went home and I took uh, I took liberty. And you know I've been home a few times over the years. I never brought that up much. And you know, just a a week liberty and yeah. you have a pretty good time and then you go back. You know, and and it's always hard to go back. You know, you don't really want to go back. Mm. You know, and you don't really want to go either, but, you know, but anyway, um, I said, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll look up this command. So I, so they flew me out, the, the, the commercial plane flew me to, uh, oh, let's see, flew me to Long Beach where I received my orders and from Long Beach, they they put they put me on uh, the Hornet and flew me off by jet. This is my first experience oh, wow. in a, in one of these fast jets off of a off of a carrier. Oh, what an experience! So we took off, and I'll, I I believe you know, and, and of course this is all the way I see it. We we no more than got up to a very high altitude, and we were descending down. Uh, you know, and I know it took more than fifteen minutes to go nine hundred miles. But they lit me lit me on another carrier in San Francisco. When you hit that arresting cables, it's quite a jolt. And you have to have a mask on all this time, you know, an oxygen mask, because you wouldn't be able to breathe, you know, you go so high. So that was the fastest of all the many uh, flights I'd ever had. I'd, I'd been on, you know, my dad used to be, uh, he used to fly around on the, on the, some of these uh, 
little single engine planes and and uh, and then I was also on the helicopters and all kinds of stuff but this was the, the most exciting of them all so they let me on that this other carrier I believe it was Yorktown and uh, so they, they took me off the to Yorktown. They said, well, we gotta, we'll got escort you into town, into this uh, private airfield, and you're going to take a, a private plane. This is in the middle of the night. Wow, huh. If you're going to take a private p plane from uh, San Francisco to, to uh, Seattle. So we get on there, and, and, and uh, we take this private plane from San Francisco to Seattle. Well, it's just a two-passenger plane, and this guy says, he says, you ever been in one of these before? And I said, yeah, I was in one of them before. And he says, did you ever, he says, would you like to see the town? He says, we got all kinds of time to spare. We're not even supposed to be here, uh, arrive yet. I says, okay. So he flew me all around the middle of the night in San Francisco, showed me the lights. <laughs> and he says, do you ever do a loop? And I says, well, no, I ain't never done a loop. But I mean, I was fearless, you know. So he did a big loop in the middle of the night like that. And I, I thought that's the last of that, you know. I don't need no loops and <laughs> You don't know where you're at. Yeah. And and so anyway, he got me into into Seattle, where lay, where another little plane that would that was to fly me on to uh, on the on the Bremerton base. Uh, took me on over to Bremerton, and I get to Bremerton, and it was at night, and they says, well. You know, you'd be staying at this one barracks. We go in this one barracks, and there's nobody there. I mean, this is your room, but there's nobody there. Uh, there'd only been three other members had reported, and then and they didn't even stay in the barracks. So I, I get there, and the next morning that I, I find so they report to work just like always. These three other members. There was there was a radio man and 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 uh, and the boss mate. And one other one was there, and he says, uh, I said, well, where's our crew, and where's our ship, and where's all this stuff at? And he says, well, you don't have a ship yet. And he said, you'll be staying in these barracks, and this is all the crew that is so far. Huh. Well, I said, what, what am I doing up here at this time? There's nothing to do, you know. He said, well, he says, they, they require that we still stand guard on this hull, you know. So we'll take you down there to show you the ship. So... They took me across the this uh, the Bremerton Naval Shipyards, and we went down, and we seen this hull of this ship. It looked like a, a little boat, you know. Well, this is your ship. I said, you're kidding me, you know. This thing, you know, it's my ship, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's called the Pueblo. And he says, it's an old army, arc, uh, old army cargo vessel that we had given... The South Koreans during World War, during the Korean War, we just left left it behind, and which turned out there was three of them left behind, and we purchased them back to reconstruct them. So it was in the process of being reconstructed, and uh, and uh, what they were doing was they was out, they it had a deck on it for cargo. And what they were doing was they were stripping all that off, and they were redoing the berthing, and they were they were uh, were going to build uh, a unit, a metal unit, on a cargo deck. Uh, and at the time, I had no idea what this was going to be or anything like this. So, um, but they said anyway, here's your here's your barge, that that's your quarter deck. And that leads up to there. So he says, you got to go down there and stand there and watch and make sure who goes on and off. Are you kidding me? No. Is there anything to do? No, there's nothing to do. Hmm. There's nothing. You just stand there and no log, no, you know, and a quartermaster's job, part of the quartermaster's job is not only correcting navigational equipment, and you also did celestial navigation, but you recorded everything that happened on any ship right. in a log. And... I'd seen a great deal of that action when I was in Vietnam, recording down helos and and who was shot up and all this, and that's something I kind of left out. But things come back to my mind. Yeah, you right. Know? That was I'd like to see some of those books now after all this time. Uh, anyway, anyway, so I didn't know what to, I was supposed to do. So 
I uh, I just stand down there and do my watch, you know, and just just go out on the beach. Just just instead of going to the barracks, shoot, we just went into uh, Bremerton and have a good old time. Well, I, I kind of ended up meeting a re a real nice person, a a, a, a Navy uh, corpsman. She was really nice and. You know, and helped me get through a lot of this situation, you know, and made me feel comfortable. And, and we used to go on uh, salmon runs when the salmon would run the streams in Bremerton and we'd go out there and hand catch them, you know, and have a pretty good time doing that. A lot of experience with that kind of country because, you know, that's pretty heavily forested area and it can be pretty cold in the winter too. And so anyway, we we just kind of clicked off the days there waiting, and I kept seeing things going on and coming off the ship. And one time they had a big bunch of highly classified radar equipment that was coming on, and they they had a the Yardbirds had a had a crane, and they were moving this crane on board. They were moving this piece of equipment on on board with this crane, and the cables broke. And, and this piece of equipment fell down and broke all the pieces. And I heard one yard bird, oh, there went a million and a half. And anyway, I guess they had to replace that part, but it was a pretty important part. Hmm. But they had dropped it and broke it. Up, up to this point, had, had they given you any idea what was what, what the still place? Has no idea. Really? Huh. Had no idea what was going on. Uh, they were building everything on there, and they told me that I wasn't allowed to see the equipment or nothing. You know, I could go on board ship, but I couldn't go into that that new room that they just welded together, and I I, I couldn't do anything. Huh. And I did see the, the my plot room, and and the bridge and all this, and and I had we had no officers at the time. There was nobody else, and eventually more and more guys were coming aboard. You know, over a period of time and. So what eventually happened was was uh, and the officers come aboard and they was everything was hush hush and they they started giving us educational talks about you know what goes on here you leave it on here you don't talk to nobody you don't do this you don't do that you know but it was so obvious as I'll tell you here after a while but anyway they they got the ship all all together and we did some trials. Out of uh, out of uh, from uh, Bremerton to San Diego and back and so forth and shake shake down cruise yeah cruises and uh, everything we had problems with with the steering and we had problems with the engines and especially port engine you know and we had problems with the equipment and uh, but we managed to get it and eventually the captain come aboard and then. Then we had our commissioning, and that was a, a good commissioning ceremony because the the, the uh, founding fathers of of uh, Boys Town in, in Omaha, Nebraska, come out, and as you may not know, the commander in Booker, Commander Booker was from. Uh, uh, that's where he went to school, and that's where he lived, is oh. in Boys Town. Huh. Yeah, and he was a football star. That's that be uh, Lloyd Pete Booker, and he was married to this gorgeous person named Rose, who's to this day we're still. She's an honorary crew member, and she comes with us. But um, anyway, they, uh, they we had a, a great ceremony, and and I'm original plank owner. That means I'm some of the original first crew because all the crew wasn't there. As a matter of fact, most of the uh, communication technicians, the CT, so it's made up the, the, a great deal of the crew, um, they come on later. A lot of them come on later. Most of them had never been on a ship, and they might have been in many years in the Navy and never been on a ship. Huh. So they come on board and we got outfitted to to proceed on our duty stations and uh, but it, it was it was so hilarious with this because all this time we still didn't know what was exactly going on uh, I was correcting charts that 
you know, and they and so far I only had to have a confidential clearance. And uh, so just before we got underway, they decided that that since I was there was only two. I went from I went from twenty three people under me when I was uh, when I was on the Hornet to nobody under me. There was just uh, I was a I was a, a, an an E four at the time, and Charlie Law was an E six. And that was the whole quartermaster. That was all of the, the quartermaster navigation department. And uh, then we had uh, Lieutenant uh, Murphy, who was the executive officer, and we had Lieutenant Commander Booker, who was the commanding officer, and that was, that was all of us that had anything to do with navigation. So we, uh, they decided that I should should have its secret clearance so they they I can't remember all the details on how they come up with a secret clearance but I ended up with a secret clearance which I lost hmm. so anyway we'd have to correct these charts now of off the coast of Russia Korea Vietnam and all the confidential areas you know and um, but still, I had no idea what what we were basically doing. So finally, the word came that we needed to start to go to, well, to 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 back up just a little bit. When we had a commissioning, when we had our commissioning, uh, we were we were one of two ships commissioned on the same day. The Palm Beach was the other one. The Palm Beach would never see action. What we were doing was we were going to go to Japan for some trials. So we go to Japan and we try to get across the try to get across the ocean with a with a, a port engine that's halfway working, and the steering keeps going out. And we get into Yakuska and they can't handle all of it. They, they do what they can in Yakuska in the shipyards, fixing up what they could. And they sent us down to Sassable to finish it off. I think that was particularly the, the engine. And uh, so it's, and it never did work quite right, but, but we still managed to get, get by pretty good and they, we got our orders. And in the meantime, all, with the, all this time that was going on, Commander Booker was asking that since this now I didn't know again I didn't know what this ship was all about yeah but Commander Booker was demanding things from a, an Admiral Johnson that certain things be fixed on this ship he wanted he wanted uh, classified paper destruction devices he wanted uh, artillery and everything else and they kept denying or saying they did they they, they they eventually got him a, a burn barrel. They got him a paper shredder. <laughs> and and they got him an axe to, to, to demolish up. sensitive equipment. equipment. And after a great deal of time of complaining, they finally put 250 calibers on. They were mounted on the decks, open exposed just a tarp throw it over and the word was that they was never supposed to be visible to anyone not the enemy and not anybody they were to be kept tarped down and it was just there yeah so anyway the the commander says well on the way out well we'll we'll do some training you know and we that's my first experience on a 50 caliber and i shot barrels and then I shot a Thompson submachine gun. Of course, forty fives was I carried them a lot. I even had done shore patrol when I was on the Hornet a little bit with one of them. So I knew how to work the that that particular part. So anyway, uh, we we did that and and uh, we we headed out and of course at this time I didn't know that there was big arguments between. 
Commander Booker and his commanding officers and what would should be and what shouldn't be. But we did go out with the perspective that the banner, which is our our older brother ship, had been out there for at least a couple of years doing the same thing and they had been harassed by Koreans and Russians but never no provocations. So they sent us out there. We would be the replacement for the banner for a while. The Palm Beach was supposed to be our replacement. So uh, as it happened, we traveled. Uh, well, actually, we traveled through. Uh, I'd like to say the the leeward side of a typhoon. Uh, it, the seas were so rough it was just impossible. I never got sick, but the entire crew were hmm. in, they were in bad shape. But we we had uh, up in the plotting room we had uh, bars that went across the ceiling that you could hang on to while you did your navigation or stuff. And I remember distinctly many times that sometimes you know we could see nothing but blue sky out of our windows and sometimes you could see nothing but water. Oh, yeah. And sometimes we rolled the other way and you look down to the right of you and there's the water. And it was, because the ship wasn't very wide, you know, and, yeah. and you and you had windows all the way around so you could see everything. Well, Commander Booker uh, passed the word, says, we got to get out of here. We're going to roll the ship if we don't. So he, that's when he made the turnaround. That's when we did all the heavy rolling. And we turned around and we got out of that area. If we'd have proceeded and went by our orders straight into that typhoon, we'd have probably sunk. Yeah. Well, we got over that and we went on in, in a couple of days and we got to uh, got off the coast of uh, of uh, Korea and we worked our way up to to uh, just off the coast of Russia, uh, Vladivostok. Yeah. Oh yeah. And all this time, there was things going on that I didn't know for sure. But it seemed awful funny. I thought about it in the past that when we were in in uh, Sasebo, uh, we'd go to bars, and, and it seemed like everybody in these, every local in these bars knew what our ship was all about. Is, they, they even called us a spy ship. They knew it, but I didn't know it yeah. because of the banner. See? They knew what we were all about, and so anyway, we get we 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 get on our way over there, and, and all these things were going on. And I was the uh, I was also the ship's clock person. In other words, I had to I had a uh, I had the uh, Greenwich England timepiece. Where all the ships go by, this one, this one timepiece, and I'd have to call in, like once a week, you know, and verify that it wasn't a second or two off, and all this stuff. Hmm. And uh, then I'd have to take and, and and go down, and once a month, and I'd have to set every clock on the ship, reset every clock on the ship, check them, you know. And when I'd get to the the uh, which later to this spatial little room, this radio room, uh -huh. which later become what we call the spook shack. Yeah. Then I'd get there. Well, I had a I had an officer with me, and he would program entrance in there, and he would blindfold me and and lead me in, and they would lead me. They had three clocks in there, and they'd lead me to a clock. And and put me point blank in front of that clock. And raised my my bandana on my eyes, and I could see the clock. I couldn't turn yeah. my eye, wow. head, or nothing. I could see equipment both sides, but I didn't know nothing anyway. And then they turn around, and after you were all done, they lend you out. And then they done blindfold you. Wow! You didn't see nothing. And uh, would that prove to be later on a, a good thing in, in I, your case? I think it probably did yeah. because. They couldn't come after me for that part. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't need me. But uh, by okay. the time by the time they got rid of my department thing, they didn't need me for anything else anyway. Oh, okay. Okay. So anyway, we was out and 
so we were headed back down the, the Korean coast from Russia, and, and we were approached by a, by one curious trawler, and he kind of went around us and kind of looked us over and left. 